lot of insight in the first year with our new connections with the Brain and Mind Institute. Uh, several of our students have been welcomed into labs by principal investigators in the Brain and Mind so that their uh, philosophy can be properly informed by the empirical work that it's relying on. And that's been very exciting. We've all been on a very steep learning curve. Um, and uh, uh, we've also uh, been very fortunate to have a postdoctoral fellow position um, as uh, part of uh, a donation from the uh, Rotman uh, Family Foundation and from the uh, university, uh, some ma matching funds for that. Um, uh, we've been actively involved in this lab program as well. And uh, the other component to that is the, this speaker series of which we now have our first neuroscience uh, speaker. So we're very excited about that as well. So I'm going to uh, turn the floor over to Mel Goodale, the director of Brain and Mind, to invite our to speak, introduce our speaker for today. Thank you, Chris. Well, I'm uh, I'm absolutely delighted to have this opportunity to uh, introduce my good friend and colleague Alfonso Caramasta. Now, Alfonso is the Daniel and Amy Starch Professor of Psychology at Harvard, uh, where he's director of the Cognitive Neuropsychology Lab and the co-director of the Mind-Brain Behavior Interfaculty Initiative. He's also the founder of the Center for Mind and Brain, not Brain and Mind, Mind and Brain, uh, at the University of Trento uh, in Italy, where I think it's fair to say that he's shaken up uh, the often complacent uh, and certainly Byzantine uh, Italian university system uh, with his can-do attitude. Uh, Alfonso was born in Italy uh, and immigrated with his parents to Montreal in his late teens. He earned a BA from McGill in 1970, and after that he ended up doing his PhD work at Johns Hopkins University. But as he told me last night, he nearly ended up doing a PhD at Western. He was accepted uh, as a graduate student with Zen uh, but in the end, for various reasons, he ended up going to Johns Hopkins. Now, I have it from good authority that when he was finishing his PhD at, at John Hopkins, his department was in recruitment mode, and he attended a lot of the job talks, and he asked the candidates such penetrating and trenchant questions that in the end, the department decided to hire him. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he stayed at Hopkins, uh, eventually becoming a full professor, and in 1993, uh, he was recruited by Harvard, where he's remained ever since. Now, Alfonso studies the functional and neural architecture associated with several cognitive systems, including language processing, object processing, conceptual representations. And early in his career, he did this uh, by studying cognitive deficits in neurological patients. Uh, and this work was characterized by, by great creativity and, and attention to detail. And today, like many of us, uh, he uses fMRI and the other modern methods of uh, cognitive neuroscience. But again, I think he's remarkably clever and insightful in, in the work he does. In fact, I think it's fair to say that he's one of a handful of scientists who's provided fundamental insights into how the brain represents and accesses knowledge about the meaning of words and pictures. And Alfonso has been recognized in various honors, including uh, an honorary degree from the Catholic University of Lausanne in Belgium, uh, the Javits Neuroscience Investigator Award, uh, the J.L. Uh, Signore Prize in Biology and Cognition from the Ibsen Foundation, and an honorary professorship from Beijing Normal University uh, in Beijing, and a lecture to the Society of Experimental Psychologists. His talk today is entitled Representation, I hope it still is, it's entitled Double the Representation in the Mind Brain, What Good Are Sensory Motor Representations? Help us. Uh, and they should use it in a derogatory uh, 
that way. <laughs> so if I, I'm going beyond perhaps the evidence and data or whatever. Um, in any case, I am um, um, I, I, I'm going to uh, try and, and um, deal with an issue that I think is of great interest uh, uh, certainly to um, cognitive uh, neuroscientists, uh, psychologists, cognitive scientists, and neuroscientists, uh, but it is also of great interest to philosophers. Uh, and that's a question uh, of uh, uh, the role of representation uh, in the mind brain sciences. Now, I think that uh, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, fair to say that all theories uh, of cognition, explicitly or implicitly, uh, make assumptions about types of representations in the working of the mind brain. If there is one thing that is not great, is that we sometimes make uh, these representations far too implicit to allow us to, to really understand what we are, we are claiming. Um, and uh, it is not unhealthy for us to, once in a while, perhaps become philosophers and ask ourselves, that what are we really saying when we say whatever it is that we're saying? And so, uh, although I'm not a philosopher, I'm going to try and ask some questions that I, I think philosophers should be asked. I'll do it in a plodding way of a neuropsychologist, a neuroscientist, um, and uh, we'll see what, uh, uh, what it does. Now, I've been interested in the problem of, uh, of representation um, for many years, and uh, um, the, the, the problem, the, the way in which I've been interested in this is uh, out of the work that I, I've done over the years in, in some areas uh, of, uh, of cognitive science and neuroscience, and um, in our field, you always hear things like uh, something like visual working memory, or uh, visual semantics, um, uh, sensory model representations, uh, and I, I, I confess to have always been confused by these claims. And uh, I remember that I, I was uh, the outside examiner of thesis in my department, and the student had there was work on uh, visual working memory, and uh, I was the outside examiner, so I said, so Justin, uh, you know, what's visual about like visual working memory? And there was very long silence, uh, and then gave an answer, but it was very clear, it was very uncomfortable about the question I was asking. Because it wasn't clear what it meant, what was visual about visual working memory, if it's, if it's something to do with the kind of stimuli you're using, or when there's a very explicit claim about a content, a particular type of content, and that is usually left unspecified. And um, so I mentioned this problem, um, and, and over the years, uh, I've, uh, I've, uh, um, uh, I've been uh, lucky to have had uh, two sparring partners in, in, in worrying about this issue. Um, uh, one is Tim Shabas, uh, who with whom I had a very uh, heated exchange in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the in the journals uh, on visual semantics, and more recently with Alex Martin uh, on a related uh, issue. Um, and, and so it's been great because because I, I disagree with them profoundly on the things that they say, and of course they disagree with me just profoundly. Uh, but it's been uh, exciting to be able to um, to discuss with them um, some of these issues. Um, now, recently, a large number of, of theories have been proposed, uh, which emphasise uh, the role of perception and other processes uh, for higher cognitive abilities, uh, such as language comprehension. Uh, and actually understand it. And uh, these theories I'm going to group uh, um, as uh, 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 the rubric of embodied cognitive, uh, embodied cognition theories. And all of these theories assume um, that higher cognitive abilities uh, are achieved in large part or entirely uh, through the reenactment of processes that are primarily employed for sensory input processing uh, or for action execution. Now, there are many flavors uh, of, uh, uh, of these uh, 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 theories, um, uh, but two claims uh, are shared um, by the great majority of these theories. Okay? Uh, first, uh, they all uh, converge uh, on the claim that semantic knowledge is carried by sensory motor representations. And um, this means that 
uh, one way to prove it is that the neural systems uh, that are closely involved in formation and achievement of semantic knowledge are the same mechanisms that are necessarily that are necessary for perception in different sensory modalities or production of actions. Uh, and in line with this uh, claim, it is proposed that the understanding of actions of other persons requires a contribution from one's own motor system. For example, this is the neural claim uh, that uh, uh, argues that to be able to understand or to observe an action of others, uh, the action, the understanding is going to require that we activate our own motor system, and it's at that level of motor representation, if you will, uh, that this understanding occurs. It's a very strong claim, um, and, uh, uh, and a very interesting one. Um, uh, now, this claim has uh, not only been uh, in, made in the case of the motor system, uh, but also uh, the achievement of semantic knowledge concerning perceptual properties, such as colors of objects, critically depends on the neural systems implicated in the perception of these properties. And uh, in this example, I'm going to use color perception. In fact, in my presentation, I'm going to use uh, one example. Let me give you the one example I will, I will be uh, discussing. Now, um, the, uh, the other assumption that uh, all these theories make uh, is that uh, most of these uh, theories, or I think perhaps all, emphasize the importance of simulation uh, in conceptual processing. Uh, so that, uh, what this is saying is that the achievement of semantic knowledge not only involves uh, neural systems that are involved in perception uh, or actual execution, but it involves them in performing the same processes that are carried out during perception or action execution. In other words, semantic processing amounts to a reenactment of stored modality-specific representations in the relevant sensory model processes. For instance, all the semantic knowledge we have about chairs could be exhaustively described as a collection of interacting modality-specific records of what a chair looks like, of the action sitting, of the some other sensory experience associated with sitting in a chair, and the like. So this is the, I think, the two core aspects of this kind of uh, theorizing. I will discuss some of these issues, but I will do so from a particular perspective. I will start by considering the issue of levels of representation, rather than attempt a definition of what I mean by levels of representation, I hope it will become clear through the vignettes of research issues I will discuss. As I said, I am not a philosopher, and I have a hard time trying to come up with a clear articulation of what I mean by representation. But I think that in our, in our work of scientists, uh, we run into this notion all the time, and we use it. Um, and so I'm going to try and, and discuss this notion through the examples of, of particular research um, examples. Now, uh, also in, in the spirit of, of trying to have this general discussion that goes beyond the, 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 the specialists in, uh, in my field, uh, rather than, than discussing with you a whole bunch of experiments on, uh, uh, on, uh, um, uh, on sensory motor processing and so on, I, I'm not going to do that, but I'm going to use uh, two examples, uh, and I'm going to go to them in a little detail uh, to illustrate the, the points that I want to make so that we can have a discussion uh, uh, about this issue. So let me begin with a strange phenomenon that I think most of you are familiar with, but I go into a little detail for those who are not familiar uh, with this phenomenon. Now, uh, when patients with right parietal damage are asked to dissect a line, like this one, um, they behave in a strange way. They produce a strange response. They dissect the line uh, as if a part of the line were not there. That is, they will just go and put a uh, point uh, in a position uh, that clearly might be the half of, of the object over which they were able to perhaps perceive and make their response. Now, uh, uh, patients with this type of death are said to have what is called hemispatial neglect. Hemispatial because it's half, roughly, and spatial because it's all spatial extent. Now, uh, these patients, uh, the, the death is found not only uh, in one task, a perception task, but in many different types of tasks, including uh, copying and drawing from memory. So these are examples of the patient's performance. As you can see, uh, this patient didn't put the all, didn't copy the whole picture from memory. The patient ignored this part of the spacing window, 
he had all of the digits, the numbers that were involved in that, and this is a copy of that flower. Um, and the difficulty is found not only in a motoric response involving uh, manipulating space, but it's also found in a verbal description of a picture. So uh, this is a patient that I studied some years ago. Um, the patient says, what is going on in the sink? I guess she's, going, she's washing dishes, she's making a real mess. I think that's it. And clearly what, what is obvious is the patient is reporting only what's happening on one side of this picture uh, and uh, not able to report, ignoring the other part of the picture. Now, in all of these cases, the deficit is spatially specific. It affects a spatially defined part of an object or scene. Now, in a moment, I'm going to argue, I'm going to ask the question, well, what's object? Um, if, if the patient goes a part of space, then you know what we mean by space, and if it goes a part of an object, what we mean by object? What might be an object, such that it could uh, be the basis of which to uh, have this kind of deficit. Now, uh, the strange behavior extends unexpectedly uh, to a task that would not seem to involve space, deciding the midpoint of a numerical interval. Say, the patient is asked, would you please tell me uh, what's the midpoint between 11 and 15? Okay. And uh, um, in a very uh, a clever study, a study by, um, uh, by uh, Zorzi and uh, uh, collaborators, Zorzi, Griffiths, and published in 2002, uh, they uh, looked at the performance uh, of uh, uh, control subjects, healthy controls and control patients, and what is plotted here is the size of the interval, I guess the print here is too small to be legible in the back, I apologize, um, uh, but the interval here is 3, 5, 7, 9, so these are different um, the amounts, different uh, uh, extent of interval, uh, and what's plotted here is the mean deviation from the midpoint. And so if the person is able to do the task perfectly, get the midpoint correctly, then the deviation should be zero. And in fact, the deviation is zero in all cases, in all, uh, for all different interval sizes, both for healthy controls uh, and patients, control patients, patients who have lesions in the brain and are damaged in some way, in some way, but who don't have visual neglect. However, what Zotzi and colleagues found is that um, uh, 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 neglect patients behaved uh, as if they were uh, bisecting a line. That is, they were deviating, the response is deviated from the midpoint, uh, as you can see here, two and three. This is, means that uh, in making a judgment about, say, uh, an interval between one and nine, rather than taking the midpoint, uh, they would be taking a point that is very close to nine. Is this a clear one what this is? So this is essentially the same behavior that you find when you bisect the line, but now you're finding it in a task where there is no line. Right? And there is no space. Okay. So this is a real paradox. So what is going on? Um, and uh, the, uh, the, the, the solution uh, proposed by uh, Zorzi and colleagues is that in fact there is a line. Uh, and it's just those of us who are uninitiated into the wonders of neuroscience and cognitive science uh, who think naively that numbers are these abstract objects that, um, uh, that perhaps would define the ways that mathematicians define the sets of sets and so on, but really numbers are defined in a very different way. And uh, together with uh, other researchers, Stan De Haan and many others, introduced the notion of a mental number line. So there's a number line out there, and uh, what is being neglected is that mental number line, and so the behavior looks just like as if they're dissecting a line. Now, um, this this idea uh, uh, found itself also in a in a very clever experiment um, uh, by uh, not sure I can pronounce it uh, L O E T S C H E R, not sure, not sure, um, uh, something like that. My apologies. Um, and uh, um, a, a very clever study uh, was carried out. The subject were asked to generate a random number in a range, say between 1 and 30. And they were asked to do this um, uh, sequentially, say they generate one random number and then another. And they were asked explicitly, try to generate random numbers. Okay. Now, of course, they're not random, you know, we're not uh, random number generators. Um, uh, there will be all kinds of systematic biases, but that's okay. The point is that they are generating haphazardly. Uh, values between 
one and uh, um, and uh, um, uh, and uh, uh, and third. Now, what what these investigators did was they looked at not only at the responses subjects gave, okay, five, ninety, two, so on, but they also looked at where the eyes were before the subject gave a response. And they asked, is there a, can we predict what number the person's going to give? So we're going to look then at, suppose the subject said 5, and then says 19. So now the response is a number that is larger than the preceding one, 5 to 19. And they ask the question, will the eyes be to the left, to the right, looking up, or looking down? And if there is a mental line, number line, uh, say this group from the right to left extension, if there is a mental number line, if I am going to say 19 out of 5, then one expectation might be that I should be looking to the right, because 19 is to the right of 5. Is this clear, the logic? And surprise, surprise, we'll make it into current biology, you know, one of those journals that likes to publish new things. Um, uh, and uh, what this is for each subject, each participant, I hope this is visible, uh, certainly visible, I this length was the back. Uh, the black bar is the horizontal deviation, um, movement, eye movements, and the red is vertical eye movements. And the idea is that uh, large numbers from the left, small numbers to the right, large numbers from above, small numbers to below. And what this is showing is the prediction accuracy, so that uh, the eye was pointed to the right, if the subject was going to produce a large number, the eyes were pointed to the left, look at the left, if the subject was going to produce a small number. Furthermore, and this is very clever, they also looked at the, um, uh, how far the right front to the left the eyes were looking uh, from the midpoint. So if you, if you go from 5 to 25, you should be looking really to the far to the right. But if you go from 5 to 7, you should just be off center a little bit. And this is predicting, um, this correlation is showing that, uh, that the change in eye position uh, is, is correlates with the magnitude difference, how far the right to the left we go. Okay. These are amazing phenomena, I think we all, uh, we all agree, and I certainly would have predicted these kinds of results. Um, and, um, uh, um, and, and they are uh, truly interesting. Now, what Russia concluded is that something like this merely thinking, I'll read you, I'm quoting them, this merely thinking of a number causes a change in eye position. Alternatively, the selection of a modular shift constrains the selection of numbers. In any case, our findings substantiate earlier claims of an analogical representation of numbers. So he has a strong claim. So they use these kinds of data, the fact that they special extent and the fact that the eyes are looking right and left as indication that the representation along which they are operating, so here's the notion of representation comes in, is one that has spatial extent, or a spatially organized dimension. And so, and so as in the next part of the conclusion, a close look at the eyes may not only reveal what it is in a person's mind, but also illustrate how abstract thoughts are grounded in basic sensory motor processes. So here again, to introduce the notion of sensory motor, clearly we have a, um, uh, a claim that an abstract notion like five is represented in some mental number line, something very concrete, analogical. Okay. So, um, so this is uh, 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 what, uh, what Zonzi uh, concluded. Um, uh, this new form of representation or neglect constitutes strong evidence that the mental number line is more than a simple than simply a metaphor, and that its spatial nature renders it functionally isomorphic to physical lines. Thinking of numbers in, in spatial terms may be more efficient because it is grounded in the actual neural representation of numbers. Okay, now this is a amazingly strong claim. I don't know what it means to be grounded in actual neural representation. Uh, I don't know what, what, what but, but if we just forget the part neural and think of it as some kind of functional representation in a theory, what they're saying is it's grounded in the sensory motor type of representation. 
and in a more recent publication that argued that the notion of a mental number line fits well with the idea that componential dynamic sensory motor simulations underlie the representation of concepts. So this is the kind of evidence that, that one could use to say, uh, so I don't know what the representations are, but at least if I come up with a, an example of a representation, uh, and, uh, and then a specific claim about the content uh, of uh, those representations, and in this case, uh, uh, one that is specified uh, in terms of uh, uh, analogy to a physical line. Or it's, in fact, it's more than analogy, it's as a more with a physical line. It's a very strong claim. Now, before drawing conclusions uh, uh, from these kinds of results, we should consider the fact that neglect does not result in impairment in a number. So the same patients we've just talked about do not have impairments in the following tasks, and that's very important. In number of magnitude processing, magnitude judgments are normal. So even if you ask people to say which is larger, six or two, the patient has no difficulty telling you six. That's to me a problem because if the patient is not able to um, uh, 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 has to operate over a number line, then it's not clear to me how the patient could perform this task. Parallel judgments is an even uh, order, the final net. In a random number generation uh, task, in a numerical, in a numerical range, uh, again, uh, it's not clear to me that you would predict that these patients will be fine. If I give you the range of generating numbers between 1 and 30, uh, on a number line theory, you would predict that the patient would have systematic bias to say 15, 19, 29, 30, uh, 16, uh, uh, 29, uh, um, uh, 17, and so on, um, but not report them. Two, one, and so on. That is not. And this was done, this study was recently published by Lutcher and colleagues. And even in the midpoint of numerical range task, if the patient is allowed to use spontaneous mathematical reasoning, say if they're, if they're not told that they have to, uh, that they're not allowed to use mathematical reasoning, then uh, they're fine. So if there was a bit between, between one and, 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 and five, you know, the patient might say three because they do one plus five is six, six divided by, by two is three, and they say three. Right? So, so, so the mathematical reasoning ability is more intact. So um, then it's not likely that, that number concepts uh, uh, are reducible to points on a sensory motor number line representation. I just have one or too many knots there. Um, uh, so ignore the double, double negative, it's slipped. Um, uh, so it seems to me that that that, uh, 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 that that we should be cautious about jumping to the conclusion that in fact the authors have shown that numbers are represented in uh, in uh, uh, or represented directly uh, in this um, uh, mental model. Still, uh, why observe spatial effects in number processing tasks? Um, uh, a different interpretation uh, of relation between space and type of representation can be given. Um, um, if, uh, 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 I mean, do, do, do we require to say that they are uh, represented in this type of sensory motor format? And I'm going to argue a close look at the phenomena of neglect. So we, let's look now at the representational claims one can make from neglect, uh, allows us to sort of sh shed some light on what the results of these investigators actually might show and, and what we can conclude about types of representations. So um, a primer for, for, for those of you who are not neuropsychologists or familiar with this, uh, it turns out that there are different types of spatial neglect. So here's the performance of one patient, the patient MR, and the patient was asked to, the two tasks is to cross out all the sheet of paper, sheet of paper, cross out all the lines, and the patient cross out all these lines, and go those, copy the scene, the patient copied these two objects, and uh, these were those two. Uh, but then there are other patients, especially like MG, who, uh, when they asked to cross the lines, crosses the left uh, of these lines and, and leaves these uncrossed, and the same thing for these. And, and then these were two different objects. So applying some very strong principles of grouping and so on, you have one object, is another object, it causes one part of the object, and the same thing applies to something like a scene where half of each object is so this says that look, neglect is not of a kind. I mean, there may be different kinds of neglect. And, and the question, the important question is, 
um, of a lot of representation types of the words. So let me uh, very quickly uh, give you some, some results that I, I some study I did uh, many years ago, in, in fact, uh, 25 years, 23 years ago, 23 years ago. Um, um, and uh, it, you know, so it's, it's like there's like fish in the air, it's good old cases, and they're pretty exciting. Uh, we have many other patients, some, 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 but, but this is, uh, I think, the most beautiful. Uh, so this is a patient, we asked them to, to read the words, uh, and uh, as you can see, the patient made that the patient had the lesion in the left or right um, um, lobe, but the patient made errors on the right part of the word. So, uh, so human was said is human, hound is house, stripe is strip, um, and non word strings like patch is patcher, drain is drill. So the patient is making errors on the right part of the stimulus. Now, um, if you do this for over many, many hundreds of stimuli and, and we, we torture the patient, uh, ask them to read many, many, many words you can see here. Perhaps you can see, I have no idea what is left in the back. Um, but you don't have to be able to read uh, exactly what's here. What you can see is that as the word gets longer, the patient keeps on making errors, but the errors seem to be going on, on the right side of the word. Because uh, if you compare the four letter word with the nine letter word, the patient here makes 15% errors for the uh, 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 word length of four, but for the uh, uh, word length of nine, the patient makes no, no errors. Okay? So it's almost, it's as if the patient were making errors on the right half of the word. Right? Um, and you can show this by reordering the stimulus, so that you now center the stimulus, and what you can see is that all the zeros are on half of the stimulus, and the other half of the stimulus, they're on the errors. And the errors increase as a distance from the center. Okay, so that's the uh, result. So that's not new. This uh, many patients have been reported to have these characteristics. Uh, what was exciting was that this performance is invariant under topographic transformations. So if the patient was asked to read vertically oriented words, like rigid, the patient might have said right. Or rank, the patient might have said rank. Furthermore, if a patient were asked to read a word shown in the sort of mirror reverse, in, in reverse order, um, a comment, the patient must say comment, making errors uh, at the end of the word, which is the left part of visual space, uh, <laughs> but on the right part of the, stimul of the center of the word. And uh, here are some examples I, I won't bother you. So in, in, in the vertical reading, blending became blemish, motionless became motel, uh, uh, the non words like stress became strip, uh, non word like Nathan became neither. Uh, as you can see, the errors are occurring now at the bottom of the stimulus, the bottom part of the stimulus, but the right side of the word. And the same thing for um, mirror reverse reading. Um, and uh, um, if you simply plot uh, performance, you're looking at uh, words in six letter long so that you can compare directly across regular reading, vertical reading, mirror reverse reading, and um, a naming of all those spelled words. So we tell the patient that um, uh, P I T C H E R, uh, uh, the patient would say perhaps uh, pitching uh, or something, would make an error on the right uh, of this orally presented stimulus. Again, suggesting a kind of difficulty with uh, uh, the right side uh, of, uh, you must agree with me, an internal representation of the stimulus, a representation that is not as a wall with the physical world. The physical world here is being violated all over the place. Right? The patient is making errors on the left of the physical world um, in the very worst words, making the bottom part of, of the world, uh, but in all cases it's the right part of the, of the world. And so you can show this, you can, you can uh, show this to the stimuli, so this is a uh, Take the word common just for because we're looking for common representation. So uh, error percentage, uh, position of the word horizontally displayed, errors increase on the right, uh, vertically displayed, errors increase the bottom of the word, uh, displayed in very reverse. So common is the beginning is here, errors are at, the, uh, at this part of the physical space. So if you look at the physical space where the errors are, this defines it. If you reorganize the stimuli, so that we now 
do the, to drop it to the center of the world, a canonical representation of the world, now you can see that these lines that line up <coughs> perfectly well. Now, um, it's important to just make one, uh, one uh, other observation. Uh, this patient's performance uh, uh, differs from the other patient that showed you before MR. The patient that neglected would seem to be the, the, uh, the, uh, the left part that's, uh, of, of a visual scene. Um, this patient, uh, asked to read, that shows the same centering phenomenon. So asked to read various words, the patient makes errors, in this case on the left, which is the the right hemisphere the lesion, uh, but as you can see, uh, the errors are, are organized only on the, on the, on the um, uh, left part of the stimulus and not on the right part. Okay. However, what is crucial is that, that for this patient, she made no errors in reading vertically displayed words. So if you gave her to read the word rigid vertically, she said rigid. If you asked her to read the word rigid shown horizontally, she was not able to read it, must say right. So clearly, what we have is one person whose behavior is controlled by the physical stimulus, and one person whose behavior is controlled by an internal representation of the stimulus, where a canonical representation is computed and might serve as the basis for accessing a word in the lexicon. Now, I apologize for putting up the slide uh, and uh, there for, for the people who, who are more interested in neuropsychology and cognition, uh, it's not crucial for what, what I want to say. Um, I just want to point out that, that this requires you to make the assumption that there are multiple levels of representation that have to be captured. And so we can then ask if there are multiple levels of representation, what is the, the content of this representation? And what is the format, what is the information represented? So in the case of, of something like share that is shown, say, in the left, uh, uh, upper visual field, there's a level, I call it a centric feature map, uh, uh, where uh, this stimulus is represented. It can be stimulus-centered, you can draw attention to it, when you draw attention to a stimulus, and so it will retain its orientation, because you're just drawing attention to a physical stimulus and you pay attention to it, so it's still vertical, but now it's centered, stimulus-centered in a shape map. Uh, but then, if you want to access the lexicon, we argue, you don't go there from this. To do that, to get into the lexicon, you have to construct a representation that represents objects that are abstract, and that's what they're put in these like, little lines to indicate they don't correspond to visual shapes, and in fact, it has to be general enough to encompass uh, different ways of spelling the word, uh, the fact that you can do it with only spelled words, uh, the fact that all is not fundamental, and you have to create this canonical representation, and hence the word center reference description. Uh, the predictions you can make from this uh, um, are interesting. Now, uh, uh, one other point I want to make is that the neglect uh, deficit in this patient extended beyond word uh, and object recognition uh, to spontaneous drawing, as I already showed you before, um, and spell. So the patient has to actually write or spell words. The patient uh, made errors in that task, and remarkably, it was identical to his reading to a reading performance. So when asked to to uh, um, uh, to, uh, to write the word floor, so she's a, she's a pen signature, please write floor, she wrote F-L-O-O-R-E, asked to write uh, uh, jury, she wrote J-U-R-D, uh, asked to write sneeze, she wrote S-N-E-E-D. As you can see, she's making errors in writing the right end of the, of the word. In all the spelling, could you please spell orally now, uh, Korea, she would say C-A-R-R-E-D, uh, Poodle, P O O D L E R, afraid, A F R A I N. Again, in normal spelling. And this is important because it rules out at least one hypothesis about the nature of the deficit, a kind of a difficulty in operating in space. There's a theory of, of neglect, there's a deficit in operating in space because there's no space. When uh, I'm, I'm producing a sound, uh, 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 the, the, the only space in the space of the articulate is a desk, there's nothing to do with space uh, uh, of the letters in the, in the world. And the same thing happens when this patient has to spell backwards. I don't know how people do this. I guess Americans and Canadians who speak English learn how to spell in Italian, uh, given that we have this beautiful language that is very relevant. Uh, we don't have to learn how to spell words because they'll, they'll spell the word sound. Great help. But in English, you have to learn to spell. And uh, my children always ask me to spell words, and I can do it. 
Um, I mean, I had to write them down, but I, I wasn't used to, 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 to naming the letters. And so she has to spell the words backwards, so absorb, she's supposed to say B-R-O-S-B-A, and she would say, uh, and so on. Okay, she would spell it this way. Uh, so she would produce N-W-O-S-A-B. She would produce it in the reverse order, and she would make errors at the beginning of what she's producing, um, uh, and she would produce correctly in the end letters corresponding to the left part of the stimulus. Okay. And if you now look at, uh, uh, at the performance uh, in written spelling, oral spelling, and backward spelling, you can see that it's very much just like the digital form. So uh, the pattern of results uh, suggests that even the lowly uh, word form representation uh, is far more abstract than a sensory theory, uh, sensory word theory allows. That is, uh, this, I say lowly, uh, uh, distinguishes it from uh, how we might represent the uh, um, I might represent uh, um, uh, um, uh, the meaning of, say, dog, the meaning of bottle, or whatever, which, which involves all kinds of very complicated things, whereas a word, the phonetic word, is all you have, it's just there, just the letters that take it up. Okay? And even that would require, I argue, uh, to make a very strong claims about the representational uh, content um, in the brain, in the mind. Uh, so, um, uh, so, so this uh, uh, allows us to make uh, um, uh, 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 to make some some claims. Okay. So uh, first, uh, the, the claim is that um, we have to have an economically oriented graphemic form independent representation. So this representation has to be accessed from all kinds of modalities. Um, it is not going to have a physical representational structure. Uh, it's only just more of the space it can, given uh, the performance I, I've shown you. Um, uh, and, uh, 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 um, yeah, let me go ahead. Uh, the, I think the arguments are clear why um, these things uh, follow. And uh, second, um, the fact that spelling um, the deficit took the same form in respect to whether a written or oral response was required. Uh, and the performance remaining varied regardless of the order of how to use the deficit to a serial order processing mechanism, as well as a deficit to pre-order mechanisms for planning action in space. Okay, so say all spelling doesn't require planning in space. Unless you make the assumption that, 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 that our friend Zorzi made that, that, that there is a equivalent of a mental line uh, for words and the deficit is to that mental line. Um, and, and third, um, uh, the fact that uh, a, a reading performance remains invariant for horizontal, vertical, and vertical words, and that reading and spelling performance were qualitatively identical, suggests that reading and spelling involve computing a spatially coded abstract orthographic representation in a word centered coded system. So it is spatially coded, okay? it's not merely a matter of order, um, uh, and, uh, um, and so there is space. I'm, I'm not denying that there is space. Uh, what the issue is that um, what do we mean by space? So how do we reconcile uh, the need to have abstract representations of letter strings or graphemes with the requirement that they decode it spatially? How do we get spatially specific deficits across both words and objects? Remember, the spatial is making errors not only with words but also with with, uh, uh, with objects and drawing objects. So at the most parsimonious account, this would be a theory. That, that explains all of that behavior. It doesn't try to explain only one part um, of the data. And uh, I, I, I want to make a, a, a simple assumption, um, uh, and that is that perhaps we need to separate content from space location in processing different kinds of objects, including words. That is, we have tended to make the mistake uh, of assuming um, that we have to represent a particular type of information together with the other types of information that apply to the object. And this is not a new idea, um, and uh, certainly not to this audience, um, given uh, Mal's work. Uh, there's now virtually unanimous agreement for a separation of two crossing streams in the visual domain, and it has been argued uh, that a similar principle applies to other domains. One that is primarily concerned with computing visual form and recognition of objects, so-called what system, and one or two, depending on your views, that is concerned with capturing location and grasp information, the where, how system. And they said, so if we separate them, um, uh, these two kinds of representations, 
then the representation of the word uh, will be information about the spatial location, and that will be perhaps a spatially organized system. Uh, and then there will be the content that is represented, and that content is not subject to spatial properties. Uh, and so the abstractness of the representation uh, is maintained while preserving the fact that there may be a spatially organized mechanism or device. Okay. The point I'm trying to make here is not to convince you of the correctness of this theory, but to show you one way in which we can challenge uh, the notions that I presented earlier. Um, so that showing a spatial effect in processing numbers and words does not on its own imply a sensory model level of processing. It's not enough to show that there's an interaction between space and certain kinds of contents to conclude that therefore that content must be sensory model. Okay. If you have independent evidence for able to argue that representation is more abstract than sensory model representation, then it's your responsibility to come up with a theory that will try and reconcile those two and not simply empty of meaning the notion of representation. Um, so, um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, a similar argument uh, can be developed for the larger literature on the representation uh, concept of conceptual object knowledge and meaning. That is, uh, a similar argument can be developed for the punitive sensory model dimension of objects in action, uh, in action knowledge. So, to reiterate, um, here the claim is that retrieval of semantic knowledge not only involves neural systems that are involved in perception or execution, but it involves them in performing those same processes that are carried out during perception and action execution. In other words, semantic uh, processing amounts to reenactment of stored and other specific representations of the relevant sensory motor focuses. And the question is, what is the evidence for this claim? Okay, so I'm going to now take this kind of reasoning and apply it to the most standard kind of evidence that is being presented. Um, I am assuming that we said an hour and an hour from when I started talking. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, okay that's it. I'm getting um, short of time. Okay, so uh, so here is uh, the more typical evidence that is cited, and I, I call this uh, the drive to reduce concepts to sensory motor representations. And I think that there are two kinds of evidence that have been produced, and some of it has been produced that, uh, in fact, there are some researchers here who are involved in this kind of work. Um, and the two, two classes I'm going to look at, behavioral studies showing interactions between motor uh, and sensory areas uh, in conceptual processing. So there, I'll give an example of that. And uh, neurophysiological and neuroimaging studies showing uh, activation of sensory motor areas in action recognition and other conceptual tasks, such as understanding the sentence. So, so the first kind of evidence that could be just like the one already presented, the Hosher study, where you show interaction um, uh, between the sensory motor, um, uh, between motor and sensory areas and conceptual processing, or at least punitively between motor and sensory areas and conceptual processing. The other one is to use the brain to help you um, uh, uh, decide whether something um, involves sensory motor processing. And you do that by attributing certain kinds of initial contents to parts of the brain. And if that part of the brain um, uh, shows up in the cognitive task, then you say, well, then it must be sensory motor. So let's go to the argument. So let me illustrate, so you're probably all familiar with this, but let me illustrate some, uh, I think, very elegant, very clever studies that, that have been done uh, in this area. Here's one by Benberg and, and, and uh, Kasha. Um, the subject is given uh, a sentence like open the drawer, uh, and uh, it's asked to decide if the sentence makes sense. Uh, uh, but the response uh, that they will produce is uh, by moving the hand to one button or, or to the other. So the button that they could move when it's incongruent, um, it would have to say, if they have to say yes, um, um, oh, can you see the yes? It's not visible. Okay. If they have to say yes in this case, uh, and they have to say yes, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's a good sentence, uh, we'll do this by moving the finger away. Uh, uh, from, uh, uh, from the body, uh, but that motor act, uh, that, it's okay, I, 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 it's only the few slides that have the property, but uh, 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 it, the motor act you engage in is incompatible uh, with the act uh, of opening a drawer. So opening a drawer is why you take the, get the, the, the drawer, the, the knob, whatever, and you pull it toward you, so the gesture is going toward you, uh, 
uh, as congruent, uh, and begin to respond yes by moving it away, it will be incongruent. And what they found is that, that uh, subjects responded faster to say yes, this opens the drawer, uh, the sentence makes sense uh, when, the, when the response was congruent. I think it's very clever. Um, and uh, uh, this one, they were much slower to respond when they had to move uh, the hand in a way that is incompatible with the meaning, implied meaning of the, of the sentence to open the drawer requires putting to work. Okay. Uh, here's another clever study uh, by uh, Swan uh, and collaborators. Uh, uh, the ranger uh, so the eagle in the sky the nest. Uh, and uh, uh, they were asked for one or two tasks. Uh, they were given um, uh, a picture after they heard the sentence, such as this, and the task was, was this item mentioned in the sentence? And uh, uh, the picture they could see might be this, or the picture they could see might be this, and this is a match because Rex on the eagle in the sky, um, presumably on this theoretical perspective, requires that, that you image that you have a representation that involves the wings being open. Um, and uh, uh, whereas uh, um, uh, saying you saw an eagle um, you see, uh, uh, was this item in the sentence, uh, having this item, this object, this eagle sitting, is incompatible, is a mismatch uh, with the uh, presumably sensible of the representation you construct for that sentence. And uh, uh, reaction times uh, supported uh, this, uh, uh, this, this, uh, this view. Uh, so on the match, subjects were faster uh, uh, than the mismatch. I hope this is clear. I hope we get done. Um, so, what can we conclude from studies that, that uh, from such studies, for claims about the nature uh, uh, of conceptual representations? Uh, um, so, so um, uh, supposedly, uh, um, uh, under the proposition about uh, let, let, me, let me, for sake of time, let me let me go directly to um, uh, to. What is involved in this task? So um, uh, the, the sentence was uh, the sentence was uh, uh, the ranger saw the, the, the eagle in the sky or nest, and uh, uh, so uh, you might say the eagle is a bird of prey. It's in the sky. Uh, an eagle is flying, perhaps flapping its wings, uh, um, and that's the, these two are the same. Eagle is a bird of prey uh, in the sky. is not the same. In the sky in the nest. Uh, uh, an eagle is flying, perhaps cutting his wings, an eagle sitting comfortably with wings folded, is the kind of representation you might compute. Um, and, and so when you then get to these two stimuli, they're not the same, and not the same with respect to the sentence you, you constructed. Now, uh, 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 from, from these, you can conclude nothing about what is going on, or the direction of the effect. That is, if I see, if you give me a sentence like, I saw an eagle in the sky, um, uh, part of the meaning of eagle uh, is contextually specified uh, as being in the sky as flying. And flying uh, uh, provides the further information about the object, the objects that fly like, like birds and outstretched wings. That's what they fly. If they were sitting like this, they wouldn't be flying. Uh, so the representation you're constructing, the semantic representation you're constructing, actually is something that would be similar uh, to this object. When I see this object, uh, what I'm computing as I'm seeing this object is a eagle with wings outstretched. So the fact that you get the results that, uh, that um, uh, Zuan got tells you nothing at all about the direction of the effect. It could be that the semantic representation is driving the effect. And the same thing, of course, applies uh, to this task. Uh, again, um, uh, the push-pull study, uh, where the laws of the effect a while at the level of encoding instructions for responding. If you if you are instructing so that to pull towards you and to pull away from you, and the semantics of pull toward you or pull away from you, or the semantics involved in a drawer, pull toward you when you open a drawer. So um, so um, so the problem with, with this class of studies is there are many many such studies, and I think they all have the same um, the same uh, structure. Uh, is that they do not allow us to establish the direction of the effect we serve. Is the interaction the result of representing conceptual information in a sensory motor format, or is the effect the result of interpreting visual motor input conception? So when you have the effect, you don't know. And so, so, um, so in, in fact, in print I've said that those studies, studies are very interesting, and, and you should try to understand how this interaction takes place, um, uh, but they do not provide the, 
uh, information. And there have been many, 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 many dozens of studies of this type, and people could even publish more. But I'm not sure that they're going to change uh, uh, the interpretation. Now, to get around this problem, uh, many researchers um, uh, have, have tried to uh, go directly to the brain. And I'm going to use only one example um, uh, from, from this. And, and I'm going to use an example from, uh, um, um, uh, as I said, one of my sporting partners, Alex Martin. Um, Alex Martin was involved in this project, although he involves other people, uh, including Ken. Um, uh, so, uh, color knowledge is a particularly um, a good uh, 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 case study. Uh, color is uh, an ambiguously visual property. Uh, seems possible to define areas in the visual cortex differentially involved in color processing um, and should lead to clear predictions of the embodied cognition theories, um, specifically uh, overlap in sensory areas. So the claim here would be, look, if our understanding of uh, uh, the fact that, that uh, I don't know, that fire trucks are red uh, is in fact represented uh, as a, in a sensory motor representation, then we should find that when I ask you to think about fire trucks uh, somehow, um, you should activate just those areas of the visual cortex that are involved in processing uh, the, in the perception uh, of color. And that's the basic idea. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Alex Martin and, uh, and Chow uh, did one of the early studies in this area. Um, they had the subjects perform a number of tasks, has the viewing of color on a dramatic pictures, naming of color uh, and achromatic objects, naming this object, this object, this is red, and this is uh, uh, not colored, uh, naming the color of colored objects, saying red versus not, naming color implied by an achromatic object. Okay? And uh, this is important, so this is a condition that requires the retrieval of semantic knowledge. This, you have to have access to the meaning of the object to be able to give the color of something. So if I show you uh, uh, a, uh, an achromatic uh, apple, you might not say, if you say red, it's because you have to go to memory somehow and, and reenact on the theory that has been proposed. Um, uh, your perception of red is so you have to go, uh, presumably, in this uh, perception system. However, in the early study that Chow and Martin uh, published, uh, they didn't find evidence for this. What they found is color perception areas are quite distinct and quite uh, far away uh, from color knowledge areas. Um, and of course, I was very happy to see this. Um, uh, uh, this was in 1999, uh, but Alex is very tenacious, uh, and as uh, is uh, Larry, Barcelou, and Ken, and the others. So they came up with a better study. Uh, and this study uh, is one that uh, has subjects that make judgments about uh, uh, the color of an object. So eggplant, you have to say purple, yes or no. Higher raw, yes or no, and you can make a judgment about color or about a motion property of the object. Okay, so this requires retrieval of the meaning of those objects, of those words. And they also have the color perception task, which is a much harder perception task, uh, uh, involved the Fonsworth uh, and Cell uh, test. The subjects were required um, uh, to decide if, if these ranges, I don't know if they're easily visible uh, in the back, um, if the ranges form an orderly uh, new sequence uh, in a clockwise direction. So this is a classical test for uh, color uh, perception. And what they found uh, is uh, uh, that, uh, uh, so this is uh, uh, the presumed uh, uh, semantic uh, uh, knowledge, uh, the verbal knowledge problems, uh, so color um, greater than motion properties. This is a color perception task, and the red is the overlap. And what they found is that there's lots of areas activated in the color perception task, a number of areas activated uh, when you uh, do the uh, semantic task, as it were, and there's an area of overlap. So this is uh, um, uh, what they found. So this is a blowout of that, uh, of that, uh, uh, of that uh, 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 section uh, where the overlap. So what are we to make um, uh, of these results? The authors conclude that their results support an embodied theory of cognition. And they say, evidence for the direct overlap in the neural basis um, of color perception and stored information about objects of different color and that conceptual knowledge 
is grounded in the brain's modality specific system. So they conclude that this is evidence for the theory that we reenact color perception processes in the course of uh, understanding or thinking about uh, the meaning of objects, such as the color of an object. Now, I think that this conclusion um, uh, is too strong um, uh, for the results that they present. Uh, the overlap could be at the point uh, where perceptual processing leads to conceptual categorization. And this is, I think, another one of the problems in our field, that is, that we we do not have a clear idea of what we mean by perception. We use these words rather loosely. Uh, we don't have a clear idea of what we mean by conception, conceptual. And we say this overlap, then there must be sensory motor processes. But that, of course, begs the question. When you do a perception task, don't you also do conceptual tasks? The processing? When I process an object visually, don't I always categorize it at some semantic level? So the mere uh, demonstration uh, of, uh, um, of overlap, it doesn't tell you whether overlap is occurring uh, uh, at a conceptual level of processing or at a perceptual level of processing. It could be all conceptual, and that area has nothing to do with sensory motor representations. It has to do with the interpretation of prior stages of processing, as I showed in the neglect case, uh, that now is no longer uh, a sensory representation, a summary kind of representation. And in fact, uh, I think against this, and, 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 and I think, in, in, uh, uh, to be fair to the authors, uh, they point out some of the problems with their conclusion. Um, uh, there are well documented double dissociations of patients with achromatopsia, that is a, a disorder uh, in a deficit in color perception, uh, with spare object knowledge, color knowledge. So patients who cannot recognize color, cannot process color, have no trouble at all telling all kinds of things about the color of objects. And uh, there are patients uh, with impaired color, uh, object color knowledge with spare ability to perceive color. So patients who, uh, who have no knowledge of the color of objects, but they're perfectly fine in perceiving color. And I guess an example from one of my um, uh, studies many years ago with my collaborators from Italy uh, and, 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 uh, and Harvard, uh, this is a, a patient's performance. Um, uh, she was severely impaired uh, severely selectively impaired the object color knowledge, nor with form and object, uh, another uh, object knowledge, with spared color perception and even color name. The patient could name yellow, could name brown, but then when asked to perform, provide the colors for these objects, uh, colored for objects, she couldn't do it. Okay, so she had a selective knowledge uh, a disruption for color uh, in the face of all the so let me give you one final um, uh, uh, result that I have, uh, so that I can conclude. I, uh, I think that, it, so I can give it, it's one of my studies. Uh, 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 we can address directly the question um, uh, of where object conceptual knowledge might be represented. Um, and uh, um, su such experiments have, have shown, I think, I think very nicely, uh, that um, uh, conceptual knowledge is not represented uh, in uh, perceptual processing areas. And so this is a study which I'll, I'll present very quickly uh, with uh, Marius Pielin, a postdoc of mine, now a researcher at the Center for Migrate Sciences in Italy. Subjects were asked to, uh, we, we had with these kinds of stimuli, and you can see these are all, uh, all uh, uh, kitchen objects, all of these, uh, these are all garage objects. Uh, these are objects that require a particular kind of uh, rotation movement. Uh, these are uh, objects that require a kind of squeeze movement in honor of this university. The grasp is a very important part. Uh, um, and the, the grasp can be, um, uh, as you can see, the different kinds of objects involve grasp. Um, but um, uh, 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 so these, so these, so, so objects that are in the kitchen and the garage can involve wrist rotation movements, or can involve uh, 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 grip and squeezing. Um, and so, um, so we can ask the question: How is this knowledge represented? Where in the brain do we represent the fact that these two kinds of objects, even though perceptually very similar, all kinds of things and so on, where do we represent the fact that they involve the same kind of action? And where do we present in the brain the fact that these kinds of objects uh, all live in the same kind of place? Okay. And uh, um, the experiment uh, uh, layout uh, 
is uh, 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 very simple. Uh, you present an object, and in one condition, they had to do uh, a context to say if the object was found in the same context, and you simply judge that yes, this is found uh, in the same place, um, yes or no, uh, or an action repeat, is this the same context? Okay, so we are trying to emphasize the location or action. Uh, and then we, we did an analysis, I apologize for going through this quickly, uh, where we look at uh, a so-called multiboxing pattern analysis to see where in the brain uh, do you represent uh, information about location uh, and about action. And we did this by correlating, by looking at the dependent on activations, location of these objects and the garages of objects, and this would be the same action, and uh, kitchen rotate objects uh, and kitchen squeeze objects this is the same location and compare uh, the same um, uh, condition against the conditions where uh, you have different action and location. So kitchen rotate with the large squeeze. And when you do that, and you do this sort of looking at anatomical now, the, uh, all eyes, you look at, the, at the, uh, starting from the back of the brain forward the temporal lobe, um, and so these are uh, starting at the back and going forward, uh, the three types of uh, perception, the types of content, what we call pixel-wise information, this is how similar two pictures are, literally in terms of the pixels. Let's not call that. Uh, in terms of perceptual information, but this is a judged, a judgment of vision similarity. How vision similar is this object to this? It's a much more abstract notion of similarity, but it's still visual. And then, so conceptual information, and this information, which is a judgment that these two objects are rotated, both application even though they come from different categories. And when you find this, that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, pixel watch information is found in the posterior parts of the brain, uh, perceptual information is found in the middle parts of this, of this uh, uh, <coughs> pathway, uh, and uh, it's only in the anterior parts uh, of the left hemisphere, of the ventral stream, that you find location and action information. Okay. And you do this both with uh, the uh, anatomically defined ROI as well as a, uh, as a whole brain search. And again, whole brain search, you find the, the pixel wide similarity here. If you look at that, you find this middle part for the visual similarity, and here you have information uh, for. Uh, um, uh, Conceptual content. So, what one, uh, one thing we can say is that conceptual information is represented in the anterior temporal lobe and not in perceptual areas. Um, those areas represent formal information exclusively. There is no generalization to a category defined uh, by the functional characteristics of the object. Now, I have run out of time, and uh, um, uh, I want to, uh, I was going to. Uh, Telling you that the story I've just told you for vision, for object recognition, could have been told for action. That is, I could have taken, rather than taking synths and calling, I could have taken all and calling, uh, calling them an exactly the same analysis, and I would have reached exactly the same conclusion. That in both cases, there is no demonstration of causality of the other action that's shown. When you look at causality through pathology, uh, you find that, in fact, those disorders dissociate. Uh, and um, this would have been done for action, and uh, uh, I, I, I simply repeat what I just said um, for vision, so I, I, I don't, I don't uh, have enough to do that. I just want to tell you just an anecdote. This afternoon I was speaking to one, I forget who I was speaking with, one of the postdocs, I think, uh, graduate students, uh, and he told me about a paper that was just published, and, and I just saw it, um, that basically by a camera, who is one of the people who have been a strong proponent of the embodied cognition theory, and he tested a specific claim that's been made by some researchers in the field, like Boulanger and, uh, and Kuvermula, that claim that patients with Parkinson's disease have disorders in processing action concepts. And camera, who is from the camp, says that's not true. Uh, patients with Parkinson's disease do not, in this analysis, um, have uh, difficulties with action concepts, they have difficulties in processing verbs. Um, of all sorts, irrespective of the particular Johnson and how they have. Okay, so uh, I, I had some final conclusions, uh, and I'll just summarize them. Um, 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 the level of representation, uh, it seems clear to me that there are quite a number of levels of representation, even in the simplest cognitive class. 
uh, most of which in one set for the study of the mind brain of quite abstract and necessarily a model or multi-model or custom. Mm -hmm. I think that a, 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 an accurate look at, um, at, uh, uh, at the kinds of things that we would have to, to uh, appeal to, to account for our complex behavior would be extremely difficult to articulate in terms of a sensory mode type of theory. Um, um, so, um, uh, one of the things that one can ask for is, for example, is what is the scope of sensory mode theories? And it's not clear what they can be, that they can be extended beyond the simplest concept. Uh, take the uh, semantics of words referring to actions. So it's always talking about actions. Uh, um, well, uh, what is uh, um, uh, what is meant by uh, by um, um, by uh, an action um, a concept? And I'm ignoring all the complexities that have to do with morphological processing, uh, uh, grammatical processing, and just focus on conceptual information. And it's difficult to imagine how actual concepts can be explicated strictly in model terms. Action is too broad a category to be given a proper characterization in terms of sensory model theory. So, uh, for example, um, 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 take verbs like contemplate, uh, take verbs like think about, think about like, like remember. I mean, those are actions. Um, but what is the model component of those actions? I mean, what kind of theory do you want to propose? If you want to have a theory that ignores 80% of the language, it would be an interesting theory, but it would not be a theory of meaning. It would be a theory of a particular subset. Okay. And since we have to appeal to those more abstract concepts in any case, uh, wouldn't it be reasonable to assume that they apply also to the other concept? So we have to restrict then our attention uh, to action words that have motor, um, uh, a motor act reference, like walk, uh, smile, um, uh, but um, uh, but even then, what action concepts allow the motor system to make a contribution without the uh, claim being a priori impossible, as would be the case for uh, action concepts such as think, design, pay, play, and so on. Okay. And uh, I focused on um, action concepts here, but similar arguments uh, can be made for action concepts. Uh, think of playing cards, uh, hammer, spaghetti, Numbers and non-object nouns. What is the visual content of these objects? I mean, it's, it's, it's hard for me to imagine how we can have a theory that is half meaningful for these types of things uh, that doesn't have to appeal to other stuff besides uh, the, um, the basic processes uh, of perception, sensation, uh, and interaction. And so, even if we restrict our attention to only those objects that can possibly be thought of in terms of sensory motor representations such as hammer and spaghetti, how do we capture the knowledge that they are artifacts, have different value, um, uh, were invented at, at, at different times, invented different times and so on? All that information is written somewhere, and that is not information that we have acquired uh, in a sensory motor uh, way. And so the, it's an enactment, if there were to be an enactment, it would be the enactment of a particular um, uh, episode where someone told us this thing was invented. Okay? So that means the meaning would be represented in terms of the enactment of a particular episode. Now, I find these all extremely impossible theories. In fact, they are, I think, so impossible that even the proponents of the theories are not talked about. Okay, so to conclude, I think that, that, uh, that, that the point I was trying to make here is that we have to take seriously the fact that there are multiple of representation. And, uh, and, and I think that the question of philosophers um, and scientists, current scientists and no scientists, uh, struggling with this, articulating what those levels might be uh, and what their content would be. And we shouldn't be afraid to uh, make the assumption that perhaps we should think of separating the different parts of our representation such that some of them may be given in terms of things like, say, spatial representation, there's like a dual root hypothesis that, that, that now is proposed, um, that allows us to, to, to separate dimensions that, that may be articulated more in terms of particular abstract contents and those that may be actually much more tied to sensing of representations as might be the case in a social street. And uh, these are some of the people I've worked with and I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Alfonso. Um, questions?
Kenneth, Kenneth, yes. Yeah. First question. Oh, there you are. You were mentioned, I think. Uh, okay, I have about 15 questions, but I'll keep it down. Well, so, you, so you do believe that perception and action is important for learning, but words, concepts, and things, right? Uh, and that there are, there are there's perceptual areas of our brain, there are words that are in the brain, and areas in there. But then at some point, Conceptual motor representations become what you want to call conceptual. There's a, a magic flip over to being a conceptual representation. So, can you tell me, A, what a conceptual representation actually is? And other than just you circulate the motor information under it and just conceptual information, and then B, you know, how do you do that? And actually, see where it is in the mind and where the brain is. Right, and that's why I gave this example, because I think it's easier to do it with this than this do something as complicated as this concept where we have no good idea. In fact, there are no good theories uh, of concept of conditions, like there are no good theories of perception. So you use the word perception as if you know what we're talking about. In fact, in our field, we say all the time, perception. But we have no idea what we mean by perception. So where does perception mean? What does perception mean? Right. Uh, this, does perception include the retrieval of knowledge we have of what the object is? Now, if it includes that, then there's no debate. We have redefined concepts, and we've said that there are perception. Right? But that's, I claim, vacuous, because it, that claim has absolved itself from the responsibility of giving content to the levels of processing that it engages in. Okay? So this is why I gave this example. I think it's a very concrete one. Uh, here, there is a, a, a way in which we can talk about uh, um, these levels being computed, and there's nothing magical about it. Now, it's nice because it's simple, and you're right, I mean, it's much harder to do this for, for concept, but, but the fact that it's hard doesn't mean that you should look for the, for the, for the key under the lamppost, um, if you know that it should be elsewhere. Uh, I mean, it's clear that, 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 uh, um, uh, uh, that, that we, we don't have uh, a, there is no, to my knowledge, a good theory of concepts in neuroscience and cognitive science. Uh, um, just like there's no theory of perception. Uh, so, so what you're playing on is the distinction between sensory motor representations and non-sensory motor representations. And what I'm saying is that for you to have an account of concepts, if you can agree on what is a sensory motor representation, and you can try and articulate the thing, I'm saying if you do that, when you've done all that work, then you're going to find yourself not being able to explain concepts. And I've given a couple of examples. There's no way you can tell me how to explain contemplate as an action word in terms of motor components. It's an action word. Okay? Now, it's not clear to me how motor components could be constituted of the notion of contemplate. But it's not even clear to me that you can do this for something as simple as grasp. Okay? For the simple reason that I can grasp an idea. And you say, well, I guess I'm a metaphorical use. Yes, it's a metaphorical use, but then you have to post it in your mind, in your brain, a mechanism that says that when I say grasp an idea, I don't mean this, I mean something else. Well, what do you mean? So at that point, you're forced into having to appeal to all of the machinery that you're saying you don't need to appeal to if you have a sensory world. Here, you're not answering the question. The question oh. is a conceptual representation. Uh, well, I can, I, can, I can give you, I can give you, um, I can give it to you by, by the example I used before. So, for example, I can say a conceptual generalization, a conceptual representation, say, might be the generalization that we achieve uh, when, uh, uh, when we are able to categorize, uh, we're able to categorize these objects uh, with very different visual shapes, very different and so on, as having, uh, as having either a common location, or having a common, a common action. So, so I would say, um, I, would be the knowledge you have, the knowledge you have that all of these things involve a kind of action of the person, or that all of these objects are found in a particular location, no okay. okay. And uh, note that if you look in the areas of the brain where this information, um, uh, where visual information is represented, we don't find uh, these generalizations. 
vision in an area that is manifestly non-visual, that is it's activated by all kinds of uh, modalities. Now, let me give you another analogy, I think, to make it clearer. Uh, I, I hope. Uh, let, let's take the mirror neuron uh, uh, system that, that people talk about all the time as a possible um, uh, neurophysiological uh, demonstration of the virtue uh, of uh, neural theory. And there the claim is that um, uh, there are parts of the brain, the motor parts of the brain, uh, that respond uh, to, uh, to uh, complex actions. Um, and the all kinds of claims are made about how these things, uh, um, um, for me to understand uh, an action as a particular action, I have to activate a motor system. Right? Well, I, I think that, that that is not a reasonable claim to make um, for two reasons. One, that those of you who are familiar with the neural, neural literature know that there are neurons that fire both when I grasp something by squeezing my hand to grab the object and when I open my hand in reverse fires to grasp the object. Now, the motor act is very different in those two cases. So the only way in which a neuron could fire if it were to actually fire to the action would be is fighting to the abstract notion of grasp an object. But grasp an object there is not translatable into a motor pattern. Okay. So it undermines the very claims you're trying to make. Point one. Point two, point two, you say those neurons are motor neurons. Who says? How do we define what something is a motor neuron? Well, traditionally, we define motor neuron, they say something is a motor neuron, it's a motor neuron, if it's engaged when I perform an act. And not when I perceive something, loss of the visual neuron. But these neurons fire when I have a visual stimulus. So what makes a motor neuron in that theory motor is historical precedence. Because if you use the criteria of the physiologists as to what constitutes a motor neuron or a visual neuron, it would be those neurons that fire when a particular stimulus is presented or when a particular thing is happening. So it seems to me that, that, that these things are playing on the ambiguity of, of notions like perception, sensation, vision, and, and motor um, to a capacity. So when I began my talk, I said that I didn't know what visual meant. I always don't know what visual meant. I asked March Livingston, those of you know Livingston and Google, I said, March, what's a visual neuron? So she listened to it. So why is it a visual cortex? And she listens to stuff like, so you always ask stupid questions. <laughs> and, uh, and everyone knows what a visual cortex is, and stop bothering me. And um, so we started a group, uh, a presentation group at Harvard, and she's a member of the group, and now she's a very active member. So we asked her again, you know, March, what's a visual cortex? I have to think about it. Okay. Now, clearly, clearly, it's not true that we know what we're talking about. Okay, we can have a, a definition of visual cortex as say being those that fire when we have visual inputs. But now all the research has been shown that even very early visual areas that respond to all the stimuli. Okay? Is it still visual? Is it still visual? Okay, what do they represent? So I think I, I can I I, 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 I admit that, uh, that we don't have a good theory of concept. Uh, but we don't have a good theory of perception. We don't have a good theory of what we mean when we say perception. Okay? And so to, to say that, 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 uh, that uh, uh, concepts is a that, that, uh, that we represent when we reenact our perception, I say it's not giving us much help. Because I don't know what it means to reenact a perception. Because reenacting a perception may actually mean receiving a concept. Okay? So, so it becomes a theoretical uh, issue, uh, or uh, if you will, a, a, a an issue of what we mean by these words, but, but that problem is a problem of all of us. And since, since you are proposing, you in a particular field, are proposing a conception that would reduce those kinds of things to something else, I think it's important uh, to have an understanding. I've given you an instance uh, of the logic that I think is important, and I think it's this logic. Um, and uh, um, uh, I think it's logic, and I think that this is pretty representative of the way the brain works. Um, and, uh, and, and, and we have those kinds of levels, uh, and there's nothing magical about it. Okay. 
And the only magic is when we talk about things that are very difficult, a concept we look at the theories of. Uh, but, uh, but we can have simplified versions of that. Um, and, uh, and perhaps if we did apply the strict criteria along these lines, we might actually be able to cover some things. And this was question one. It took me 15 minutes to answer this. There are 15 questions. <laughs> Um, it, so, uh, do you think that so why do people like to appeal to particular kinds of representations? It's like some, um, and I'll maybe give you two examples. I don't know if this is a question that would be better done over a glass of wine, but maybe, you know, particular sorts of, maybe for scientists, it's satisfying to have at the end of their story, a, you know, something that they feel is more solid and more understood, something that's kind of, you know, a simpler thing. It's unsatisfying even though to prepare to exist, prepare to accept that some other kind of high level more abstract representation exists. The fact you can't characterize it very well means it's an unsatisfying end for your story. Um, and maybe another example is, you know, just in in sort of everyday life, we like to try to um, we like to try and do what we're told. So if you kind of ask to imagine something, you like to think that what you've imagined is really like the the object you've been asked to imagine, even if it really isn't. And we just, and in some of our work in imagery, we've shown that people that report clearer during, during imaging, um, doing imaging of imagery, we found that people that, like that report more vivid imagery actually seem to have a more abstract representation of the thing, rather than a, a, a representation that's more like a conceptual representation. So, I mean, what is it that, or do you have thoughts on that? just what it is that makes people like to explain things at a particular level and, and not at some other level? Well, well I, I, I would go back to this. Uh, I mean, you could try and explain the data I presented. Uh, it's a laundry list. You could say the patient didn't do well this, didn't do well this, did, did this, and you can have just a, a description of each one of those things, and you would not have any generalization. I think one of the fundamental aspects of science is to come up with significant generalization somehow. Something that, 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 that serves, if you will, um, uh, perhaps ultimately is explanatory. Uh, uh, notion uh, of the various kinds of phenomena that we think are part of the domain of interest. And, and if I didn't have this notion, I would know how to explain all of the things that I mentioned. It would, it would be clear to me why it is the patient makes an error at this point for chair uh, when uh, the patient's death is supposed to be one that is characterized by um, uh, especially specific deficit, left versus right. right? So by uh, appealing uh, to such a notion, I can now give you uh, a reasoned account for why the behavior is the way it is. Okay? And then this is the question, well, is that just, just a story? I mean, is it, can you look? I mean, how, what more do you want to know? What more do you need to, be, to have to be, um, to be hey, you know, I, I can maybe take an example that's closer to you, like what you all know, take patient DF. Um, I mean, those guys, uh, I don't know if you've heard of them, Milner and Goodell, they're Milner, uh, took that dissociation and drew a very strong conclusion. Okay. They said that that shows that there are at least two kinds of representational systems. One is the system that is based on a certain kind of low-level information about the objects, okay, and then they can specify what those are, and they have to do with parameters like size and so on, you've got some and what has to do with other kinds of properties, and it's only those properties that we given an interpretation in terms of what the object is. Now, they, they would have simply given a list of all the results, uh, but you wouldn't be happy with that. You wouldn't know what to do with it. Okay, so so, the, so the, the challenge that, that we have is to try and come up with, uh, with uh, uh, possible stories. Now, going back to, to, to the example I like to use March, when we're talking about representation, we have this group, the you know, faculty interest in the presentation, uh, and she sits in the back of the room and she once more gets upset and I don't know if people are more human she's a real character, she's a, she's, she's ah, oh, guys, I'm sick and tired of being you, she said, all this in the brain of neurons, as if that was supposed to give us an explanation uh, of what's going on, yes, there are neurons, but if I were a molecular biologist, I would look at it and say, a neuron, what's a neuron? What are you talking about, a neuron? Um, so that you, you can always still sort of look down at the reduction level and go to the lower level and, and, and say, well, this other level is not interesting. 
But I challenge those of us who would think of doing neuroscience to come up with plausible accounts of what we're doing with appealing to notions such as these. It's not clear to me what kind of, of, of story one can tell. Um, so, uh, I don't know, take, take your pick, take whatever, whatever, uh, uh, whatever particular domain uh, you're interested in, and, and my belief is that when you do that, you will run into the problem of having to say what kinds of stuff you are representing. Now, what are the properties of that thing, and how it enters, what kind of computations it enters into. And this is true in all branches of psychology. Even if you remember there was the view familiar with the connectionist revolution many years ago, uh, I mean, it's not like they were abandoning representations, they just there were different kinds of representations. Uh, if you read, you read uh, Hinton, I uh, think it was probably the, the best example of, of that tradition, um, it was very clear about those, you know, think of those things as actually having representational content. And in fact, they tried to work and then the five so-called hidden layers were captured. Uh, so, uh, uh, I, I, I just don't know how to do it. I also do it without a plea to these kinds of things. Perhaps it's a different way of doing it, but to my knowledge, no one is. Everyone, either explicitly or implicitly, makes assumptions about representational content. Everyone in the field of psychology and neuroscience does. And, uh, uh, you know, perhaps you want to appeal to grandmother cells, perhaps you want to appeal to orientation cells, you want to appeal to the Abortion, whatever you're appealing to, you are making an appeal to something uh, that is a very abstract representation. Even a line detector is an abstract representation. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I think um, I'm, you've given such deep uh, and elaborated answers to two questions <laughs> that uh, I'm going to have to um, ask. Uh, is it right, Mr. Alfred? Oh, Fred. We have a presentation, oh. and then we can go back one step. No, 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 not a presentation. Oh, uh, we have a presentation. Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, we're here. Yeah, it was a part of the story. Now we have a counter presentation. <laughs> so, uh, on behalf of the Rotten Institute of Philosophy and the Brain Mind Institute, I'd like to thank you very much for your talk. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Presentation. So, here's a. Uh, Robin Tilbag, and as wow, thank uh, you. the British Wells, the department. Uh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you.